Hello, I'm Scott McAvoy. I run the UC San Diego Library's Digital Media Lab. We provide 3D modeling, 3D printing, and 3D scanning services to our whole campus. Over the past couple of years, I've built up a specialty around a, a wide range of 3D data types. And as part of the library, I've been able to work with our archivists to explore new ways to better integrate this data into our digital archives. And with 3D data, there's a, a lot of subtleties to file formats, which can cause a lot of frustration. Sometimes, as with um, LiDAR or sonar data, we're presented with a, a huge 100 gigabyte volume in some sort of strange proprietary format. It can take us hours to download it, hours to figure out how to open it. It might cost thousands of dollars to, to get a program that can open and export that data into something that's actually usable um, for our particular workflow. The, the goal then is to make 3D data um, previewable and streamable in browser and automatically generate a lot of different formats that will save researchers and myself uh, a lot of work downstream. There are some really exciting new web tools which I think show some promise in changing this game. Um, I'm hopeful that we can change the way that we think about our archives instead of just a place to dump data after a publication. It can be a media-rich, interactive, web portal that allows us to view much of the archival material in sort of a crucial context. These next two models are examples of some 3 dified sketches I've put together, originally published by Robert Woods in the 18th century. Academia generally relies on building textual and 2D abstractions to communicate our three-dimensional world, and in that process we lose a lot of important information. In 3D we can get a much better sense of scale and complexity and nest a lot of different pieces of information together in a single context. With this tower tomb, we can see three pages worth of detail all at once. I think this is important, especially with Palmyra, as there's so much going on at different scales. It's really nice to be able to see the large structures and the finely detailed decoration at the same time to give us a sense of just how important these places were to the people who built them. I had the privilege of working with Dr. Raja and her team at the Palmyra Portrait Project. Our wonderful host, thank you for putting this together, uh, to ex better explore this concept, to explore how we might pack a lot of archival information into a single 3D context. So we built a 3D reconstruction, includes a lot of stuff, textual annotations with external links, a map, an inscription, some of Dr. Ingholt's original field notes, a simplified floor plan, information about our reconstruction method, photographs, and four watercolor reconstructions of, of the frescoes uh, projected over the structure where they were found. We added some mummies and examples of funerary portraits from other tombs too for, um, for greater context. You can view this project on the track, explore it freely in browser, walk around it in VR. It lives on um, sketchfab.com, which is a, a popular 3D publishing platform. Unfortunately, it's not in a long-term archive. It lives separately from the material that it includes. Uh, it was also a real pain in the ass to format, um, just to, to make it look the way it does in this particular platform. If someone else wanted to use this model for other purposes, I think it'd be really difficult for them to do so. So with these limitations in mind, I started looking at alternative 3D platforms and found some really powerful tools built around LiDAR. This example uses a, a Potri point cloud viewer. And I had spoken about the importance of nesting objects in detail at different scales. Here we see a one millimeter copepod, a model made by the Jaffe Lab at UCSD, a little sea bug. It's placed inside of a 12 meter by 18 meter model of a coral reef. And then we then place that inside of an 80 kilometer LIDAR model of San Diego County. That peer is our Scripps Institute at UCSD. So the, the way this works, the points in the point cloud are sorted into an octree structure, which is these boxes inside of boxes uh, holding finer levels of detail. These octrees are then loaded based on the user's distance from the object. We're effectively able to stream huge unwieldy data sets in browser, and because it's so efficient at loading only the amount of detail you can actually see at any given time, you don't need a powerful computer. I can load this scene on my Android phone on 4G as I ride the bus to work. So with this tool, the bottleneck 
for high resolution data visualization is shifted. It's no longer your local computing capability. It's just network storage. And where do we have a ton of network storage? On the library's digital archives. So this point, this Poetry Point Cloud Viewer is built on a, a simple HTML um, and JavaScript platform called 3JS, which actually allows us to view these Sketchfab models in the same space as our Point Clouds. So a, a practical application of this technology applied to Palmyra. I, I hope you're all aware of the new Palmyra project. I know I don't have time to do this story justice. In 2015, an international campaign to free um, Syrian open source programmer Basil Kartabil had gotten a lot of worldwide traction. One of Basil's last projects before his imprisonment was reconstructing Palmyra as it might have been at its height in the third century. Basil was uh, eventually executed and his friends running the campaign redirected their social media presence towards a, a really incredible crowdsourcing effort, collecting over 3,000 high resolution digital photos from tourists, making them public domain and hosting them publicly through Flickr. So I took these images and brought them into a pro photogrammetry program called Reality Capture, pulled out about 1500 pictures of the Temple of Bell and then got another 200 or so images from the Roman Society and some other Flickr users. We masked out the tourists, the sky, the, the gravel, the plants, anything that might change between the photos. And we were able to stitch together this 3D reconstruction of the temple as it was a few years before the reconstruction. The video shows the alignment, but the detail was far too great to see all at once. In this view, we can only see a really sparse point cloud, um, really not doing the, the full detailed justice. But this poetry viewer offered a new way for me to inspect the model and eventually share it online. So for reference, this model in its full detail is about 1.2 billion points. We used about 800 of the photos um, from New Palmyra and the, those other sources. It's over 80 gigabytes of point data streaming in browser, uh, enabling anybody to move between these different levels of detail, you know, seeing the full structure, the intricate reliefs, and the inscriptions. This model is available through the UCSD Digital Collections page. You can download the point cloud model and view it in browser and also, you know, take measurements, uh, a really great feature. So also, because this platform is built on simple HTML and JavaScript, we can really easily build in some custom functionality. Here we press a button to switch to the temple in 2016 after its destruction. Uh, the mod this model was created using some commercially available drone footage. I found I wasn't the only one using this platform for large-scale Palmarine models. A company called Iconum, working with the Syrian Directorate of Antiquities and UNESCO, has put together this incredible site-wide model of the, the whole city of Palmyra. I haven't been able to find a lot of information about it, but it seems to be a mixture of drone footage, satellite imagery, and some other CG models covering the modern structures. So with the previous functionality in mind, Think about how we might combine all of this data showing all the different models and different structures at different times and scales, uh, artwork and artifacts in situ over a base map like this. Iconum has used this platform to build some really wonderful narrated tours flying over the whole site. Um, you can visit it on their website, the, the link below. I put together another example showing how we might employ this tech in an archive. There are a lot of beautiful um, Palmarine funerary portraits out there. I was able to find about 30 of them in 3D form from a few different sources. Here in, in this platform, we can put them all together, view them one after each other, measure, um, change the colors to, to view you know high detail forms or, or just their flat colors. Not all of them have color, so it's nice to be able to, to turn that on and off. And here's the famous beauty of Palmyra, which Dr. Raja has published on. 30 different models, pull them all up individually uh, very quickly in full detail. Now you can embed this viewer in any website. And this HTML viewer contains all of these point clouds. But we've also got it set up so that you can embed each point cloud in any viewer. 
So here we can see a project in progress um, looking at a tomb reconstruction, the, the tomb where the beauty was originally found. You see we've got sketches of 3D model extrapolating a structure from the 1920s imagery and we've put the beauty nested inside um, our reconstruction of the tomb. And anybody could do this. Um, just take the little snippet of code showing the location of this point cloud and put it in whatever model they please. See, we, we've also got it set up next to a, a really beautiful reconstruction of the, the Tower of El Abel, now destroyed, the exterior of Dr. Vassam um at FNHW, and the interior, another um, tourist photo reconstruction from, from the new Palmyra stuff. And we can put all of this stuff together um, or view them separately, put them in whatever context we want. Here we see another implementation um, in the UC San Diego Digital Collections website. These are yearly LIDAR models of a site at Chatelhoyuk in Turkey. You can move this slider and track changes year by year in, in really fine detail, seeing which spots were, were excavated more, um, filled in, shored up, uh, whatever you want. And we can load those same models in another web page template, which just shows them side by side, so you can compare really easily. This viewer shows the 2012 and 2015 models together, mirroring the user's movement. So both models, um, you're looking at exactly the same spot on each side. So here's an example of this tool implemented inside of a, a records page on openheritage3d.org, a free repository for high-res LiDAR and photogrammetry data. We've built a pipeline to automatically generate these poetry viewers from the raw E57 LiDAR files, making it much, much easier to access this data. It was a, you know, took some real know-how to be able to view this data before. And through this pipeline, we've also been able to automatically generate some, some other really useful 2D derivatives, um, DEMs and orthophotos for all of the users for whom um, 3D is still too much of a hassle. So in conclusion, I'd like to pose this question. What is the role of a digital archive? If we can, on ingesting new data, automatically generate all of these useful tools, I, I really think that we should. It not only helps the people who want to browse and use this data, even, even stream its individual assets as embedding source material directly into their work, but I think this kind of service would also provide a lot of value to the data contributor as they could use the archive for live presentations. These tools also allow us to take measurements so it's useful for the research process. So by the, presenting this data in this way, we, we sort of extend the usefulness of the archive to different stages of the, the research lifestyle, where before it was you know just at the end. So it's useful in analysis and visualization, publishing, um, giving presentations. And we, we really have the potential to marry um, data use with the same platform where it's being preserved long time. And that said, though, I do have to acknowledge that these viewers themselves may have a short lifetime. Just this week, the, the Flash player was uh, officially retired. And we really have no idea how long the, the WebGL viewer will last or, or what's coming with its successor, uh, WebGPU. Web GPU. Thank you for hearing me out. I, I'm ready to take your questions.